a suppression movement. <clears throat> First, your discussion of this discourse on prayer in Luke 11, chapter 11. This is, your, this is in chapter 1 of the dissertation. <coughs> and it's also the text that you, uh, that you had us, that you, we used for the opening prayer. In your discussion of the Lord's Prayer, Luke's version of it, you call attention to the request on the part of one of the disciples that prompts Jesus to give this teaching, this, this prayer formula, this the Our Father. Namely, when one of the disciples says, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And as you point out then, the Lord's Prayer in this context clearly is meant to serve as an identity marker, right? something that distinguishes the disciples of Jesus from the disciples of John and from other Jews. Not so much in the manner of praying, the formula of praying, but in the content of the prayer and the effects of the prayer. On page 66 you say, the practice of this prayer would nurture dispositions appropriate to the community of Jesus' disciples. Through repetition, the message of this prayer would engrave itself into the life of the community. Well, fair enough. What dispositions? Well, you name them as this trust in God. No? This, this intimacy with God that allows a trust, a confidence in God, who is gracious and provident toward those who call upon Him. That's the disposition that is taught by this prayer, that is presupposed and enacted by this prayer. My question, is this really an identity marker? How does this disposition of trust in God distinguish Jesus' disciples from other pious Jews? Are not the same, is not the same disposition, this trust, confidence in God, is not this same disposition presupposed and expressed in many psalms and also in the Kaddish prayer that you mentioned, that you name as a, as a close parallel to the Lord's prayer. So what's, what's new here? How is this, how will this work as an identity marker? Uh, first of all, thanks uh, for your compliments and uh, appreciation of my work. Uh, regarding this question, I would say I should have added with this trust something else, the trust in the Father. Because if we consider the pious Jews and the disciples, if we compare them, of course both of them have this trust in God. But as we have studied this prayer, first of all it is uh, very remarkable because of its introduction, the, the addressing God as Father. So I think um, this is the identity marker. Jesus invites them to enter into a relationship with God as Father and Child, which, um, as scholar, scholar Jeremiah says, in any other Jewish uh, prayers or uh, their thinking. We don't see this close relationship with the believer and God as a father-child relationship. So I think this, this trust is a little different from the trust of any other Jews because of this uh, relationship, this encounter with God as father and child. So it's a filial trust, filial trust. That is, that's distinguishing. Yeah, I think so. At the end of that discourse, it's just a quick question that deserves a quick answer. <laughs> In verse 13, at the very end of this discourse, there's a parallel saying in Matthew, right? In, and because the saying is, pray to God 
trusting that he will give you Matthew, it's good things, Agatha. In Luke, it's Holy the Holy Spirit. And you argue that in the source, the Q source, that where Matthew and Luke got this, that Matthew kept what was in the source, good things. But Luke introduces a change and, and introduces the word Holy Spirit. And then you, uh, you argue that this is because the textual evidence shows that Luke, of Luke's special interest in the Holy Spirit, 26 times in Luke, 60 times in Acts. And then you point out that the Holy Spirit in Luke Acts serves as a key uniting theme. That is discutibile, as they say. <laughs> Because most of these instant, most of these references to Acts, in fact, are found in the first two chapters of Luke, rarely after, and likewise in Acts, at the very beginning of Acts, and not after. So what does it mean to say that the Holy Spirit is this uh, unifying theme in Luke-Acts? <laughs> I would say, as, as you pointed out, both the prayers and uh, the mention of the Holy Spirit comes at the introduction, the introductory chapters of Luke and the introductory chapters of Acts. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, one of the parts, one of the parts we have uh, explained that uh, Luke is giving it as a, a paradigmatic uh, expression. Or he he establishes a theme at the beginning, and he presupposes that. Uh, the later parts will be following the same pattern from the same thing. And uh, I, I agree that it's discutible. And uh, as far as there are a keen interest for the Holy Spirit, at least in the first parts of the Luke and Acts, they are, for me, a unifying factor, one of the factors which unifies Luke and Acts. Okay. Let's move on to uh, chapter 3, which is, uh, deals with various exhortations to pray, most of them in, chapter, in the Sermon on the Plain, you know? Luke's version of the first great discourse of Jesus. <clears throat> and in Luke 6.28, of course, there is this, this text that you deal with, important text, pray for those who mistreat you. questions about your interpretation of this command. You, you affirm that it is presented as a concrete expression of love for the enemies. Uh, so the, the, the larger, the general exhortation is to love your enemies. How? Well, by doing good to them, by blessing them, and by praying for them. Fine. But then there are some comments in your discussion that trouble me. Because <coughs> they're potentially misleading. I don't think you really mean what, you're, what, what it seems like you are saying. Let me give you three. Page 168. By praying for their enemies, the disciples are in a position to prove to be the heroes and the righteous ones, like Old Testament intercessors. Then, further, a disciple who prays for his enemy is morally superior to the latter. Then on the next page, loving one's enemies and praying for them allows a prayer to imitate the merciful God and to become his child here on earth and later in the new age. My question, is the practice of prayer and especially prayer for one's enemies, is this a means by which one becomes righteous, by which one becomes a child of God, as you seem to be saying? Or is prayer, the capacity to pray, and for one's enemies, is this the result of the gift 
that comes with grace, the gift that is this capacity to love that we receive gratuitously from Christ. So is prayer, the practice of prayer, a means for becoming righteous, a means for becoming a child of God, or is it the result of the gift of becoming a child of God? Um, I agree with that. Um, first of all, it would be the, the result the, the, the gift received from God so that they can love their enemies. But the, um, the expression, the Luke puts it in a way that we can also think that uh, it leads one to become the, the children of the merciful Father. So it becomes a, a consequence of loving the enemies. Hmm. And uh, I say, the prayer may not make one righteous. I, I do agree with that. Yeah. You might want to look at that again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Be careful about how you express that. Because yes. it's potentially misleading. Okay. Last question. Last intervention. Turn to the second part. <coughs> Acts. At the beginning, this is page 247 and 248. You draw a distinction that I think needs to be clarified. In identifying the very references, the various references to prayer and acts that you're going to treat, you exclude from consideration certain passages. Namely, Paul's experience near Damascus in chapter 9, 1 to 9 the related experience of Ananias in 9, 10 to 14, and the experience of Peter at Joppa, with the sheep coming down with all the animals and all that stuff, <clears throat> prior to the encounter with Cornelius, chapter 10. You assert that these texts do not present prayers, straightforward prayers, in the strict sense, but only spiritual experiences of a visionary or auditory character. All right, first question. What's the difference between a prayer and a spiritual experience? <laughs> um, probably as I began the, the thesis with the definition of prayer. Yeah, why don't you, yeah, I have a question about yeah. that. You, you, my question is, how does this distinction fit with that definition that you give? Because you, you define prayer as a personal communication of an individual or group with God or with Christ in the form of supplication, adoration, praise, contrition, or thanksgiving. What's the difference between that and a spiritual experience? What's the distinction you're trying to make? That is, in these cases, they are more like um, the angelic uh, visions of the characters in the first part of Luke, where um, God takes the initiative to give, give a message. So I think... Perhaps in it responds to prayer. Isn't the vision sometimes a risk, God's response? Yes, for sure. Yeah. In certain cases, yes. But you don't want to consider it as a part of the prayer experience. These things I, I didn't consider as mm -hmm. part of the prayer experience. Because my last question is, does Luke make this distinction? And I, because uh, there's one text, you know, this visionary experience that Peter has in chapter 10. When does this happen? In what circumstances? Luke gives us a pretty clear indication. He says in, chapter, in verse 9, before the beginning of this visionary experience, he says, when Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, which is precisely one of the traditional times of prayer. 
in Jewish pious custom. Does Luke, it would seem that Luke considers this a prayer experience, no? That illustrates the point I made at the beginning. That this ecstatic experience of the early Christians, charismatic, ecstatic experience, is part of the new pedagogy of prayer in the book of Acts. Yeah, you don't deal with it because it doesn't fit Jesus' pedagogy. It doesn't comport with that. But it's there in the text. You know, and that's the new thing that needs to be examined. <laughs> Thank you. Grazie al professor Bechard per le sue domande e osservazioni. La parola al secondo lettore della tesi, professor Lopez Barrio. Perhaps to relax for you, I will speak in Italian. <laughs> But you may answer as you like in English or Italian. Allora, per cominciare, la prima cosa che dovrei dire è veramente riconoscere il, i pregi, i valori, la, tutta la, la, diciamo, la, la proposta positiva di questa dissertazione, che mi sembra veramente molto degna di notare. E sono in una enumerazione, di sì, quello che trovo io, i punti seguenti. Il primo, il progetto di dissertazione mi sembra in generale interessante e originale per quanto riguarda la modalità di presentazione della pedagogia di Gesù sulla preghiera e sulla risposta pratica della comunità. C'è stata una, mi sembra una novità, perciò è una originalità da parte dell'autore. Secondo, nonostante il rischio di elaborare una tesi con un tema così ampio, per la varietà e ricchezza dei testi, per il pericolo di rimanere in una presentazione superficiale o una tonalità troppo generale, mi sembra che il lavoro riesce ad arrivare a risultati conclusivi di valore. Terzo, le annotazioni di critica testuale offerta, offerte in ogni testo sono accurate, precise e sufficienti. Quarto, i diversi paragrafi che sono offerti, paragrafi di sintesi lungo la tesi, i sommari diversi, sono di grande utilità e profitto per il lettore, proprio per ritenere il frutto della ricerca presentata. Quinto, le osservazioni esegetiche sono giuste, con sufficiente attestazione e sostegno da autori.